Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to 19 Washington Square North, which is the intellectual center and home of NYU Abu Dhabi here in New York. My name is Michael Pruganan. I am a professor of biology here at NYU New York, uh, but I also run a laboratory at NYU Abu Dhabi, and I have the privilege of serving as the academic director here at 19 Washington Square North. So welcome again. And it's a pleasure to see you all and to welcome you to another year of exciting and stimulating programs here at 19 Washington Square North. So over the academic year, 19 hosts uh, numerous activities, including lectures, conferences, exhibitions, and their openings. And it also serves as a meeting place for the uh, students, faculty, and need members of the public to interact and to learn. A key partner of ours here at 19 is the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute in Abu Dhabi and New York, which organizes many of the activities that offers the Washington Square community opportunities to hear experts talk about their research and societal relevance, technological and cultural impact, and importance for the world at large. I want to acknowledge the work of Sharon Hakak and Bergman, the Director of Academic and Research Programs at the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute, who with her staff puts many of these activities together. Sharon's over there in the corner. So today we are very, very pleased to see all of you in this talk to be given by Ma Maya Allison, the Chief Curator and Founding Executive Director of the NYU Abu Dhabi Art Gallery, Gallery and Project Space. Maya has a background in academic museums. She created her first major exhibitions at the Rizzi Museum in, um, in Rhode Island and then served as a curator of the Bell Gallery at Brown University. She was also director of the International New Media Showcase Pixelerations and of the Five Travers Gallery, all in the United States. Allison has curated numerous exhibitions at these and other institutions and also developed several book length projects. Recently, she curated the UAE's National Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2022. It's a pleasure to welcome Maya here to discuss the developing art scene in the UAE. Thank you, Maya. Thank you so much. I'm gonna have a little technical moment now. Me and my computer. So I'm starting with this little quote uh, because it's the beginning of a fairy tale that I like to tell um, about the UAE's art scene, um, which does exist contrary to opinions uh, that used to exist. And now that story is changing. Um, so first I wanna thank Michael and Sharon and the team at NYU and NYU Abu Dhabi who make these events possible. This is the first time I've had the opportunity to speak about the UAE's art scene in the US, unless you count during the pandemic, in which case I did do some virtual conversations, one of which was at Brown. But so it's very interesting for me, having lived in New York for 10 years to come back and be speaking about another world that I've now also lived in for more than 10 years. Um, Okay, so among the projects that we work at at the NYU Abu Dhabi Art Gallery is mapping and tracking the evolution of the art history of the UAE and its wider region referred to in Arabic as the Khalij or the Gulf. Today's talk will do so through, through the story of one particular artist, Mohammed Ahmed Ibrahim. Before I start, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the horrific events unfolding in Israel and Palestine. And I'm grateful that we can gather and contribute to the critically urgent project of deepening understanding across culture and region to recognize nuance, humanity, and histories that are too often represented in dangerously broad strokes. This is often true, but profoundly so at the moment. So here we are. So first, I wanna also just acknowledge that the research I'm about to present to you is not mine alone. You're looking at a group of curators and researchers with whom I've worked um, over the last decade, including, I'll go clockwise from the woman in the red dress at the bottom, Bana Katan, who was born in Abu Dhabi, who's now at the MCA uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, 
Uh, next to me is Aisha, Dr. Aisha Stoby, who did an incredible project with us about the emergence of modern art in the Khalij. Uh, next to her, Tala Nassar, who was our curatorial fellow and NYU Abu Dhabi student. Ala Adris, who's our head of education and publications, but also herself an artist. Uh, Christiana DeMarchi, who's an artist who's been part of the scene in the UAE for since 2007, I believe, but also is herself a curator and art historian. And then beneath that, Munira Al Sayyah, who's also an independent curator and Emirati. Um, and these people have made it possible for me to do the work that I do. I'm not an Arab art historian or a historian of Arab art. Um, I'm a contemporary art curator. And what I do is work on communities and look at how communities give rise to um, and nourish uh, original and creative work. A lot of what you'll be hearing today comes from this book um, which is the book that we produced for the project of the Venice Biennale. Um, and also from a little bit touches on this book that's about to come out produced by Yale University Press, um, which includes an essay by me about the infrastructure for the art scene in the UAE, which has a lot to do with why the history of the UAE's art was not known for a long time outside of the region. Okay. So this is a picture of Jos Clevers, who's a Dutch guy. Why are we looking at a picture of Jos Clevers? There is a story told and retold in the UAE art community of the Dutch artist and curator Jos Clevers. In the very early 1990s, and remember the UAE is founded in 1972, he was preparing to visit the UAE to teach some art workshops. His colleagues in the European Museum world warned him you will not find contemporary art in the UAE. We were there, we tried, there's nothing. This story has become something of a legend because when Clevers went to the UAE, he met Muhammad Ahmed Ibrahim. I'll read an excerpt, which is on screen, but I'm gonna give you his special flavor of how he talks. Well, when I drove to meet Yos, I saw a very strange guy big boots, big glasses, long hair, coming like a cowboy. I said to myself, who is this guy? Give me a break. Now imagine that with a lot of colorful language woven in. <laughs> then we started chatting and he wanted a ride to the hotel. We chatted all the way to the hotel because he's giving this guy a ride to teach at his art atelier. And I thought we're chatting like old friends and speaking the same language. And I thought, oh, come on. So I told him we would go and meet Hassan, Mohammed Kazim, and so on these guys. Muhammad ushered Clevers into the inner circle of an intensely committed group of artists, poets, and musicians, all of whom experimented with form and ideas very much in a contemporary and cutting edge way. He was entering something of a coded and secret world. To meet Hassan Sharif, who's the guy on the lower left in this picture, was an honor in that world. To learn the special knock that got the door to his house to open was even more rare. There was a special sand dune in the desert known as the Sand Palace, where they would gather with other poets, musicians, theater artists, and have festive and artistic times of communing. If the fire was burning there, you knew, you knew that the artists were gathering. You can see why curators might have had a hard time finding these artists. But as Clevers discovered, an intensely productive community committed to creative experimentation was flourishing during this period. As well as making art, they were organizing exhibitions and writing critically about art in the papers in the Tashkil magazine they published for years as part of the Emirates Fine Arts Society, which they founded in Sharjah in 1980. And others were centered on the Cultural Foundation of Abu Dhabi and founded in 1982. Somehow, this was not visible to the curators in question. The dialogues and exhibition advertising would have been primarily in Arabic, of course, and word of mouth. But this encounter with Clevers ultimately led the artists from this community to have their first European exhibitions in 1995 at the Sitard Arts Foundation. And then again in 2002 in a place called the Ludwig Forum. And it, not accidentally, the Ludwig Forum was the place where the curators at the time thought there was no art from the UAE. So Joss Clevers made it his mission to do an exhibition to show that there was work um, 
And that uh, kind of kicks off the beginning of the story of the, this group being recognized as a kind of an anchor group for that scene. So in 1990s in the UAE, they were not lacking contemporary artists. It had yet to develop a contemporary art market and cultural infrastructure that made artists who were there accessible to these curators. The unfortunate result was that visiting and non-Arabic speaking curators and collectors might come away with the mistaken impression that no meaningful contemporary art was to be found. My work on the subject has been an ever-growing series of revelations, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to present a bit of a case study and really focus on the story of Muhammad Ahmed Ibrahim. How do I situate his work in a history that hasn't been written yet? Now I get to be that outsider curator. Shortly after I settled in the UAE in 2012, I was touring a studio in Dubai where a number of different artists stored their work. From a distance, a sculpture in the next room captured my attention. It had a dense texture I'd never seen before. As I approached it, the neutral tones gave way to myriad chromatic variations, compressed in millimeter sized bits of paper and natural material. This raw paper mache sculpture was roughly my own height. It both invited and refused figurative interpretation. It's not an animal, not human, not a plant, not architecture, but distinctly intentional, organic, awkward. It was clearly constructed by hand. I asked my host who said it was by an artist who lives out in the mountains in a remote area that he makes work that responds to the landscape and he's also a land artist. Based on the work in front of me, I wouldn't have been surprised to learn that the artist was recently out of a rigorous MFA program, an emerging star of the art world. The spare biography conjured a kind of radical hermit, someone wise enough to reject the urban centers of art, but not disconnected from arts pressing questions. I imagine someone with a very, someone with a very serious, informed, and advanced practice. I got the last half right at least but I got a lot wrong. At the time, I could not have imagined the artist I've since come to know. A jovial adventurer, a bit of a rebel, former president of the local Harley, Harley Davidson chapter, patriarch of a large family, including many grandchildren to whom he's devoted, along with a small village of cats that live in his studio. All this and one who has spent the better part of four decades developing an intensely experimental and prolific art practice evermore on the rise today as part of a community of artists who share his unflinching commitment to and joy from their work. It's not surprising that back then I could not have guessed what sort of artist would have made the sculpture. In 2012, very few people could have guessed it, given the limited circulation of knowledge about the region's art histories and in particular, of the last half century of modern and experimental art practice that flourished in a small intense clusters around the Arabian Gulf. I have spent my time since that encounter learning about the group of artists around Muhammad Ahmed Ibrahim and also unlearning, deconstructing imported frames of reference using what helps discarding the rest. So let's have a look at how his work, at his work and how I think about interpreting it. start with this one. So this is um, an image from, from the book itself. So you're seeing a little bit of the timeline that's in there. And I, I periodically sort of dropped them in just to kind of give you the feel for his work. And this is fairly early on that this image is that you see on the wall. Um, the graffiti derived work of Keith Haring might come to mind. And in fact, there was a writer who said he was the Keith Haring of the desert. Um, but that comparison obscures more than it reveals about Muhammad's cipher, what, we, what he calls his cipher drawings, which are the ones on the left here. Um, that this formulation, the X of Y, the Keith Haring of the desert, the, um, there's another one, the Picasso of India. So there's this, this tendency to want to explain an artist that, with whom you're, we're not familiar through one with whom we are familiar. And what happens when you do that 
is that you stop seeing the work itself on its own terms. So a big part of my job was to unsee it, to see it on, to be, try to see the work on its own terms and work outward from that to build a context in which his work is made instead of what I saw happening all the time with his colleagues and his, um, the other artists, but also him, they would constantly want to interpret his work and their work through Flexus and Joseph Boys, um, and that they were always looking to the Western avant-garde as a method for interpretation. And indeed, these artists are in dialogue with the Western avant-garde, but also with the East. And this is where there's a lot of work left to do. Um, minimalism and land art are also relevant formal terms, but they smuggle in frames of reference that cannot capture a vast range of content and meaning from the work's milieu. The first hurdle is how to not underinterpret the practice of Muhammad Ahmed Ibrahim. I could look at this and be like, oh yeah, I get it. He does that land performance thing. He makes piles of stuff from outside. He brings it inside. We've seen this before. Oh, and some big circles too. We've seen that before, right? So boom, done. Here's the problem. That's not what he's doing. He's not working in the frame and in response to land art. He was making land art before he called it art. So what do you do with that? What happens when you name something art? What do you lose in your understanding of what it is? Um, and this is what um, I think is, has always been a question for me. Um, as I look at his work and I think about the fact that he was making not this piece, but work like this um, just because and then he was making also paintings, but Hassan Sharif, his peer and colleague, saw it and said, you know, Yanni, you're making land art. And he's like, land art, what's that? And he gives him a stack of books and uh, Muhammad reads up on, on all of it. And he's very excited because he's found his people. Um, and this is true, but it's also not true because he was making it before he knew about these people. And he wasn't calling it art. So one of the existential crises that emerged for me out of all of this is that I'm not sure that the word art is the right word when we're talking about making things. And so this is a, that's a separate project. Um, okay, so on the one hand, he's fully aware of the field of land art. On the other hand, he, he was making it before he knew it was that. His work derives first from his experience of and dialogue with the landscape and often from its archeology. span but also from reflecting on the nature of sacred structures, his readings on psychology and philosophy, and in dialogue with an awareness of art historical and post-modern -theor post theories and so on, all of this was part of it. He deliberately makes way for his unconscious, working from what he calls the memory drum of childhood, in particular, the pre-language plays. He talks about the images between your eye, eyelid and your eyeball that you see when you close your eyes. This sequence of making and only later naming an activity's outcome as art is something that really stuck with me. And I asked him about it. He said that he and Hassan Sharif, um, he said this applies to all of his art and that he and Hassan Sharif would postulate that none of what they did was art. They weren't artists. Art is just a word. Artist is just a name that allowed them the freedom to pursue whatever it was they were doing and to identify more of their kindred. Now, this is a key moment. If you think about art as a way to connect with your people, then the art that you're making is an invitation to the world. And when you find your people in the land artists of the West, for him, that's finding his kindred. It's kindred in a different kind of understanding of connection and meaning um, that transcends sort of traditional art historical lineages of influence. So in order to situate his work, first I had to unsituate him. Now, on to the situating. Okay. So Muhammad Ahmed Ibrahim is both is and isn't an outsider artist and is and is not a self-taught artist. These categories don't translate well into his context. Strictly speaking, he doesn't fit the definition of outsider. He didn't attend formal art school and he didn't show in institutional contexts um, until outside of um, the sort of regional ones, but also specifically, and this is the problem, it's not until you start showing in a European context that people identify that you have an art history. He had shown in Moscow and Havana and Dhaka and Bangladesh, 
Um, but he was invisible until this sort of identification process starts to happen. Since 2009, and this is the crucial moment, UAE's cultural infrastructure grew and became increasingly legible to the Biennale hopping English language art world mainstream. Those institutional developments enabled his work to become more visible. Now with the commercial gallery representation, substantial exhibitions in the UAE's rising new institutions, and his work is collected by multiple, multiple museums in the UAE and abroad. Now remember in 2007, eight, nine, we had the announcement of the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, the Louvre Abu Dhabi, NYU Abu Dhabi, all of these things were announced as being op going to open and they were announced right in the same period as the UAE takes out its first pavilion in the Venice Biennial, 2009. That moment suddenly has the whole um, English language art world focusing its light on the UAE saying, what's going on there? They don't even have any artists there. I've never heard of any. Um, so, but what that also does is start to surface who is there. So Jos Clevers forms a group. Um, he works together with um, this group to create a space called the Flying House. And that makes it so that whenever these curators who are interested in this news from this place called the UAE come in looking for artists, they go, they end up at the Flying House and they discover this group um, of sort of avant-garde artists. Um, this is a subject that I go into a lot more in this other essay, which is specifically about the emergence of the cultural infrastructure that gives legibility and visibility to these artists. But I do think that that idea of legibility is a problem. I think I've made clear by now. Okay, so here he is again with his friend, um, and that's him on the upper left in his studio in Corfukan. Um, all right. So in terms of being self-taught, this term is also not wholly accurate. Um, this entire community of artists banded together around learning, experimentation, and artistic growth. You can't really call them self-taught, but there was no institution to teach them. Some were going abroad and coming back. Uh, Hassan Sharif was translating a lot of texts into Arabic. Um, and it kind of reminded me of the spirit of Black Mount Mountain College, the sort of non-hierarchical learning um, structure, and they all taught the next generations of artists who are um, coming up now. All right. Okay. So he's part of a group distinct known as the Five. The term originated with the UAE exhibition Five UAE at Ludwig Forum. The exhibition was organized after Jos Clevers introduced them. And that became what this group was called, which is the five. They're embedded in a tightly knit circle of creative pra practitioners. This is another one, Abdullah Al Sadi, who's actually going to represent the UAE at the next Venice uh, Biennale. Um, also, someone I've interviewed extensively. But the point is that one of the things that really struck me as I started to interview these artists was how they were each other's community and network and teachers and critics. Um, and they gave each other the freedom to make take risks. And um, even as they realized there was no audience for their work in the UAE at the time, or very little, Hassan Sharif in particular realized he had to not only make art, but make his audience. And this meant a lot of sort of writing in the public realm and public uh, art installations that were informal. Um, and it created a lot of very exciting debate and arguments, and, um, but also it was very difficult uh, for the artists. Hassan Sharif had studied art in London and particularly responded to the work of Marcel Duchamp, Joseph Boys, and Flexus. And it's through this lens that the work of this community is most frequently interpreted. His brother Hussein studied theater, scenography in Kuwait. Mohammed Kazim studied music and is a proficient oud player. Abdullah Al Sadi studied English, but also spent a year looking at traditional art in Japan. Vivek Velasini brought his knowledge of art from his own community in India. Yosh Clevers comes from the curatorial world, role that we talked about. Mohammed's studies took him from Pakistan, where he explored archaeology to Alain, where he studied psychology, and so on. Um, and so this is some images of a brochure of an exhibition that they did together in, I think it was 1996, um, just to give you a feel for the type of work that they were making. And you have to imagine that this is coming in the context of where, I mean, there really was not um, a circulation of this kind of art in this community. So many people were responding to it as if it was trash. And it's now in the collection of the Guggenheim. So 
again with the validating institutional problem. That on the upper left is Mohammed Kazim doing a series called Tongue in which he takes photograph after photograph of himself, inserting his tongue into different open spots um, of objects, uh, which as you can imagine caused quite a, an uproar. Um, <laughs> I made, I showed that work when I first got to the UAE, which was, I learned a lot about the UAE really, really quickly. Um, this is Vivek Balasani who joined this group when he came to Dubai and is still a very active kind of participant in it. All right, so not outsider, not self-taught, but also yes, both. Originally I was thinking, okay, they're like the underground, you know, the Salon des Refusés, nobody likes them. They're getting kicked out of everywhere, but it turns out they're actually the most interesting thing going on. But that's not true because there was no place to kick them out from. Right, they're still showing in the Sharjah Biennial, which was just emerging in this period and getting awards. It's just that those aren't translating into recognition beyond that circle. Okay, so this image on the left is the actual artwork that I saw in 2012. It's called Tower. Um, and uh, let's see. Oh, I did miss one important point. I'll come back to it. Okay. So this piece um, in English is tower, in Arabic it's bargeel. And this refers to often this sort of traditional wind tower you would see. Um, and you can see how there might be a relationship here. I asked the artist, and this is my interpretation and I think I've got it all figured out. And at one point I'm pretty sure he told me that's what that title meant. And I asked him again, he said, no, 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 no. It's actually about the Dubai towers which is a huge shift in scale and totally different. This shift in scale is something that he does in his work. Um, and I think it's important, this is again now situating him in the UAE's history, which helps interpret his own work. Um, if you look at, um, this is flower structure on the right. He says, this is a flower. And he says, but it's also the cul-de-sacs and the loops of the new highways. Um, so his work is often shifting from the macro to the micro. Um, and so it's abstract and yet sort of has this references or sort of what he would call the, the eye memories of these other forms. In the 1980s, he made this landscape painting on the left. If you look at the fingers of the trees, this on the right is a series he does where it's always just the hands of his friend. Now this is what you're seeing here, these sort of jaunty, black line uh, series are what uh, he calls his ciphers or symbols. Um, and this is an interesting one because uh, he is actually um, not, it's not a language, they don't mean something and yet they also do. So for him, he's coding the world around him. He would say, okay, you are square as chair and he makes all these little squares and then people are circles and then I'm like this. But he's, it's, he never expects anyone to read it back. So he's ci making ciphers for his own view, but not expecting us to read it. He wants us to bring our own reading to it. And that kind of shape and these kind of organic forms relate very much to the kind of sculptures he was working on for the Venice Biennial. Um, so now we're gonna go back in time. He was born in Corfacan, which is um, a small town on the uh, sort of a port town on the east coast of the UAE. Uh, his father was um, worked in boats. He would sail for the British Navy. And at one point they relocated to Kuwait. Um, but he talks about in his childhood, they didn't have electricity or one running water. Houses were made of mud and clay. Um, and, uh, and, but they are on this transit route from India through up to Kuwait and beyond. And so he would see people coming in from the East, um, sometimes smoking opium, a lot of international trade passing through, but it was really just a village um, on the route. In Kuwait, he begins to get um, an art education um, and then comes back. Um, and one of the things that they did back in the day when they didn't have running water was the water delivery guy would leave a mark on the wall outside your door. The more marks, the more you owe at the end of the month for all the water that's been delivered. Muhammad thought that was a really cool design and added to the marks, for which he got in severe trouble with his dad. 
Now, I like to say he's been making trouble ever since. And one of the recurring motifs in his work are these lines, these beautiful, beautiful poetic lines. And you can see the movement of his hand. You can see the ink changing its density and this kind of repetition. It's not minimalism, but it's not not minimalism. It expands, it fills the room. So if I came to this not knowing about the context of his childhood, right? I'm thinking, you know, there's a lot of 70s artists I can think of. I can think of Agnes Martin. I can think of um, many artists who are working with this kind of form, but suddenly there's a new way to read it. Um, and I think this is crucial because he's finding these forms in this sort of very direct way, but he's also not uninformed about other artists. So he's always in this tension between his own background, which is illegible, and was to me until I started working with them. Now the mountains around Corfican are no joke. They're very tall, very rocky. They appear to have no color. One of the crucial things to know about them is that they block the sun in the afternoon. So he would see the sunrise every morning, but by two o'clock in the afternoon, Corfican is in shadow. So he didn't see a sunset until he went to Kuwait. It was on the boat to Kuwait he saw his first sunset and the color, and he was overwhelmed by the color. Um, and so, so the mountains loom large metaphorically as well as figure, uh, physically. Um, and uh, the other thing that's in the mountains are this, these kind of rock drawings or rock art petroglyphs. Um, this is something I really didn't know. And this is, you know, when you look now, suddenly this Keith Haring aspect of his work just goes out the window because what he's actually doing semi-consciously is responding to what he would have grown up around. So as a teenager, you imagine like any restless teenager, he's going out into the mountains, exploring, um, he would be seeing these on a regular basis. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, Muhammad, I've been working with you since I don't even know when. And this is the first time you even mentioned the rock art. And he's like thinking it's obvious, you know? And so this is what I'm talking about. Like you, you have to first unsituate and look at the actual place this artist is developing. It sounds so obvious, but it's not something I see um, happening as often as I would expect. The other thing in his area is this, what is thought to be the oldest mosque around, again, made of this sort of mud and clay structure that is how his house would have been built. Um, and he also is not convinced uh, that these were, this was a mosque. He says everything, that, that they find that's old and they don't know what it is, they call it a mosque or a tomb because they don't know. Um, which I thought was, yeah, he's very, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, this sculpture in the middle is one that is one of the first works of his that I showed that I absolutely love. And it's using the same paper mache sort of method where he rolls cardboard, covers it with paper mache, which is wet. The cardboard starts to get soft and melt and reform. And that process is what allows it to look as weird as it does. He's always kind of guiding it and directing it. Um, the other thing in his surroundings is the old Portuguese um, settlement. The Portuguese came and wiped out the entire population of Corfacan. Um, and then, you know, after a while, I think they were convinced to leave. He also makes these, which he, so this is what he would have grown up around this is what he makes, which also look very much like these things that some people call tombs um, in, in the region. And he actually got them, came to this form by studying um, this, this sacred shape that shows up in multiple religions, somewhere between sort of a beehive and a stupa. Um, so this kind of gives you like the speed tour of the context that I started to see in his work. And there's a lot more to it, but I wanted to just kind of very quickly touch on these things. Um, uh, this is more of the cipher drawings. Now I wanna spend a minute on this one um, because all right. So he, as he's working, he, he experiences this as emerging from his deep subconscious, but he has also learned to trust that in part through the kind of art education that 
uh, developed in the community that he was in. Um, and then after it emerges, then he kind of recognizes a connection. The other thing that happens though, is that I realize he has an incredibly vast range of references that we're not gonna get in a sort of typical, I wouldn't have gotten in a typical Western education. One of them is um, the, I think I've lost it now. That's not good. Hold on, this is really important. The Brethren of Purity, known as the Ikhwan al -Afa, a secret society of Muslim philosophers active in Basra, Iraq in the 9th or 10th century. Their esoteric teachings and philosophy are expounded in the Encyclopedia of the Brethren of Purity, a compendium of 52 epistles that would greatly influence later encyclopedias. My summary of it is taken uh, from the scholar of classic Arab classical Arabic philosophy, Dr. Tonelli Kukokin. Um, and I, I bring this up because he then, that was really important to him. And they have this idea of the dot of light leading to the shape that creates form. Um, now, likewise, our friend Paul Clay had a similar idea. Um, so Muhammad developed his first intentionally abstract forms out of his experiments with the movement of gouache across the page. Alongside that, he developed his cipher series from his scribbled freeform sketching from the pages of his high school notebooks. Um, his, the period of discovery when he first starts finding his forms and trusting his subconscious um, also saw his growing interest in philosophical art concepts, in particular the relationship between the point and the plane. Muhammad found this concept first in the writings of the Arabic philosophers Ikhwan al-Safa, who developed the idea that a dot begins a line. This image recurs in Arabic philosophy, including in the writings of Ibn Sina, who uses it to highlight the role of imagination in human perception. Muhammad also refers to Vasily Kandinsky's book, Point and Line to Plane, from 1926, and he's especially fond of Paul Clay's send up of the idea when Clay writes that a line is a dot that went for a walk. When Muhammad retells this, he adds his own twist. The line is coming because the point is going to a picnic. His appreciation for Paul Clay runs deep. When he first saw his paintings, he felt a jolt of recognition. Noticing the cloth Clay was using was the same as that used by Sufis, a kind of jute or burlap fabric Clay would have seen when he traveled to Tunisia and Egypt. So this is, um, I think this is, this kind of ends the, the series of comparisons, but you can kind of see where I'm going. He's looking east, he's looking west. He looks west, he sees something from the east and vice versa. Um, and all of these things are converging um, in a landscape that already has a history of mark making from long ago. So it's sort of this sense of tapping into um, something deeper in human experience. Um, and so I will end there and say that um, after being invisible and undiscovered for so many decades, um, last year he represented the UAE at the Venice Biennial. And you can see the, that combination of, of um, bright color in the front and in the back it turns to black and white and it's a reference to the movement from sunrise to sunset. Um, and I think that the the thing that, uh, the reason I wanted to focus in on this artist was to begin to ask us to think about reading art and what it looks like to read art from multiple frameworks at the same time. And the density and richness that the art starts to develop uh, when you um, stop seeing it through the lens of what you already know. Um, and that's the talk. Thank you very much, Maya, for a fascinating talk. We'll now have a moderated conversation and question time to be led by our good friend and colleague, Mason Latif. Uh, Mason earned an MA in art management from RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia, and she now serves as the head of public diplomacy and cultural affairs at the UAE consulate here in New York. She has over a decade of experience in cross-cultural and community arts development and has worked in the United States, the United Arab Emirates, and Australia. And she holds a position as a board director at Arta East, a global platform dedicated to Middle Eastern arts. And we thought it would be great to have her be in conversation with Maya uh, for the next few minutes. Hi, everybody. 
everybody that I know. <laughs> so good to see all your faces. Um, thank you, Michael. That was a great introduction. <laughs> um, and thank you, Maya, for that really beautiful anthropological journey of the art scene in, in the UAE. Um, and I also just want to thank you for uh, acknowledging uh, the Israel and Palestine situation. It's very profoundly devastating. I know it's affected so many of us. Um, but a lot of my prepared questions are um, more sort of on the macro level of, of the UAE and the art scene and what it is today and what it looks like today. Um, but before I get into it, I just want to say you, you, um, uh, Muhammad Ibrahim's work, you've likened it to Keith Haring. And every time I see Muhammad's work in person or just now, I think of the Australian dot painting, the indigenous yes. Australian dot yeah. painting. And what I find really amazing is that um, they're both native to their land and they're both responding to land. So I just I always wanted, wanted to share that with someone. I, thought, I would not. I would not be surprised at all if you felt like they were his also kindred. Right? Yeah. yeah, there's something really special about it with the with a bit of a difference in the choice of colors and the boldness of his work. But yeah. Um, but yeah, no, so I do want to start off by saying that there is something to be said about the UAE forming its literal existence in um, in the modern times at the end of the 20th century, uh, during the contemporary art era. Uh, as well as where it's situated in the nexus of sort of like the East and the West, connecting a lot of Southeast Asia and North Africa. Um, it, it And historically has been so open to foreigners. I feel like it's almost uniquely positioned to sort of contribute to an art scene in a way, a contemporary art scene um, or movement. Um, and really today it sort of has become this important hub of the arts, attracting a lot of talent, international curators, collectors, um, critics, scholars, as you described, and really sort of like elevated the UAE globally, uh, which is, yeah, I think a testament to the ecosystem that it, uh, that it has today that you sort of spoke on. Um, and so I just, I'm curious, my first question is, you know, with all of that and all of that activity that was going on with the artists um, and the galleries that were sort of popping up in the 90s, what else could have led to this oversight or this invisibility that you sort of speak on? Um, and I just, I, I'll say this, I, you know, when I think of contemporary art, I think of in the nineties, um, I think of what was happening in, in, what was happening in contemporary art in the nineties in the Western world, there's a lot of resilience to a lot of like social issues and things like that. So I wonder if it was less of a language barrier, more of a lost in translation in that, in that those outsiders are just not understanding the nuances of the region more so. Um, so yeah, so, you know, I guess, yeah, what, what else could have led to this oversight? Well, I mean, one wonders if they even knew about the Sharjah Biennial, which was very nascent at this point. I think it probably started after they visited. Like, I think um, the Sharjah Biennial starts in 1993. The Sharjah Art Museum opens in 1996. They probably would have come in 1991 where the only thing going would be the Emirates Fine Arts Society and the Cultural Foundation in Abu Dhabi. So if they went to the Emirates Fine Arts Society, if they even knew to go, only once a year these artists would show. And then the rest of the year, it might be workshops and classes. And so, you know, it's like a, like a cultural you know, art classes kind of center. And then in Abu Dhabi, the Cultural Foundation would have shows of artists from the UAE but likewise, um, most of the year it would be other types of things. So, so the, sh the opportunities for UAE artists to exhibit were almost um, non-existent most of the year. And the artists actually look back on this time with some nostalgia because they had more time to talk to each other and more time to make their work. And now they spend all their time going to openings. <laughs> but if you imagine the, the curators who, you know, my hat is off to them that they went looking, who would think even to go looking at a time when the UAE was still so new on the map. And they go looking and, and what they did was they, um, they looked for the word gallery. Mm. And so then what you get is a frame shot <laughs> with tourist paintings, you know, and they're like, it's all paintings of camels which, you know, I love a good camel painting, but don't get me wrong. 
but this was, I think this is probably what happened was that they saw um, essentially frame shops and thought those were the galleries. Like, Cause the assumption is if there's art, there must be galleries. There must be a market. Yeah. And this is, this would be before Google. So, <laughs> <sort of laughs> type in. Um, yeah, so, so, way before Google. Well, well yeah. before Google, yeah. No, but that is really, um, that is just really interesting how it also got missed in, in, in that way, but also that they were, um, you know, as you sort of described, you know, showing in places around the world as well, but still there was an invisibility that yeah. I think kind of stemmed from within the UAE. Um, or that these curators also aren't going to the Havana Biennial. Or, you know, they're just <laughs> that they're just true. not as as globe trotting perhaps as yeah. they are now. Right? Yeah. Um, and so it, was that did that feedback reach them in some way? So this, this community of artists um, that was really just essentially driving the entire art scene with no sort of cult, the ecosystem. How? did that feedback reach them and then how was their re reaction to that how was their response to that in that there was no contemporary art essentially refuting their practice in some way did they were they sort of seeing getting this reception and then feeling as though they needed to broaden or needed to sort of change their operations in some way what was that well it's it must have been um kind of a uh, a dissonance because on the one hand Within the Gulf, they were Hassan Sharif in particular was very well known. People would go on pilgrimage to try to get to see him, and often he would say no, because he didn't want to have to tell somebody their work was terrible. This is how he put it: <laughs> "Like, please, I just I can't bear to tell somebody their work is horrible." <laughs> um, but so he so regionally they were very visible, and so to hear that somebody had come and decided there was no art there must have been very difficult. But I think what it did was um, cause them to think about, to sort of think about visibility as an exhibition problem, right? So, to, so they start pursuing, you know, we do this map of um, activity in the UAE and of, of the artists in this period, 88 to 2008. And most of the shows are in Sharjah and nobody's going to see those shows in Sharjah for whatever reason, because they're mostly in these kind of um, home studio type context or like local community center type context. They start finding other ways to show. And it's in 2007, but I think they were on a trip to, they went to um, the, a biennial in Europe. I can't remember which one. And at that time realized that they really just needed to be visible year round. And so they decide to found the flying house. So they did respond to it by saying, you know, if there isn't going to be an institution that shows us year round, we'll make our own. And 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 uh, Yos Clevers, as the sort of English language uh, representative, would then go out and try to get, you know, they worked really hard to actually try to get shows in public spaces around Dubai. It was, I mean, back then a lot of hotels, hotel exhibitions were a thing, mm -hmm. mall exhibitions, you know. There, but any chance they got, they would just go all out. I mean, there's these crazy pictures of shows from that period in totally unexpected places um, as they try to be, sort of work on the visibility question. Yeah. But they also are very conscious of not auditioning for Western approval, which I think is a very tricky line to walk. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, it's so interesting because I feel like that and correct me if I'm wrong, but could have been a pivotal moment that kind of really just uh, had the UAE more broadly in terms of its sort of public backing and all of, and, and the community in general to sort of really invest into the arts and, and kind of have it this full-fledged uh, art scene that it is today. Like, I wonder if that was the pivotal moment in time. Well, I think that when the UAE, um, I mean, Sharjah all along was investing in building the Sharjah Art, what became the Sharjah Art Foundation and the Sharjah Art Museum. But when the UAE also announced the, um, these sort of mega museum projects, um, that I think that moment kind of gave a lot of artists a very strong feeling of encouragement, like, like okay, where, where it's time to, to, to invest in culture and education and so on. Um, and so I think that that boost was really helpful, but also a sense that like the, the plane is lifting off and we wanna be on it. You know, we wanna be like 
helping to build that and not staying um, kind of behind that secret closed door. And sort of on that, I want to sort of bring it back to today um, and the cultural ecosystem that exists right now. Um, honing in a little bit on Sadiat Island, as we're all so familiar with, um, you know, it's sort of going from there to where we are today. I mean, Sadiat is one of the world's largest single arts and cultural projects of modern times. Like it's quite remarkable in that way. Um, and it's attracted these world-renowned architects to design these, you know, major institutions um, and effectively sort of like place the UAE on the map among other things, of course. Um, but, you know, one of those major institutions is, Abu Dhabi, is NYU, uh, Abu Dhabi, one of the first liberal arts universities and campuses in, in the UAE, which is just amazing. Um, but so my question to you is how has Abu Dhabi's commitment to education and investing in universities and these major institutions, um, like the Louvre and Guggenheim, how has that impacted the growth of the cultural ecosystem? And in particular, what has NYU Abu Dhabi's role been in that? Um, there's so many answers to that question. Yeah. I could have kept going. I have three more <laughs> questions just on that oh, note, but well, well, I'll pause there. So, short. So, so there's this, what's interesting is that for a long time, there, there was the sense that the art scene in the UAE was fundamentally grassroots and driven by the artists who would seek support from the government, which would support them for sure, but it was not sort of being driven from the top. When this shift happens um, to build those, these museums, um, but also Sharjah is building up um, its cultural infrastructure, um, at that moment, there's this, there's this sense of loss in the sense that it's no longer artist driven. There really isn't a curatorial kind of context at that point. Artists are curating each other. Um, and then, and then, and, and there's sort of this gap identified, which is that if the artists, if, if emerging artists don't have an opportunity to professionalize, how will we have an art ecosystem that is born and bred in the UAE? And so then the Salama Foundation, which is related to the government, forms something called the, um, the, the um, Emerging Artist Fellowship, Slama Foundation Emerging Artist Fellowship. And what that does is give artists kind of a year of training so that they can then be in a place where they could apply to graduate school and MFA. So there starts to be these activities to kind of fill that gap. Um, but, but then there's this wonderful moment not too long ago where a group of artists sort of opens their own little sort of homemade um, art space. And that is a sign that a new generation has emerged and that they're, it's not the flying house. It's not like before, they're not hiding, but they're, they're sort of throwing the door, doors open and there's a lot of them, right? So there's actually a huge generation of young emerging artists in the UAE now and they are wacky. They're very <laughs> interesting. So, so, um, it's, it's just like you took that group, say you took that group of five and each of them has 15 people who think they're amazing and now there's however many that comes to. Um, but also people coming in from abroad, like you say. So one of the things is that the UAE has become a place that feels like a haven for artists in the region. And they move to the UAE as a place where you can practice as an artist um, and, um, and have a sense of safety and stability and, um, and also a growing ecosystem, but it's still not there yet. You know, I think there's, this is, you know, that Dubai has really worked on one aspect of it, the sort of uh, commercial arts sector, but also placemaking. Sharjah is working really hard on um, exhibitions that help tell a fuller art history. Now in Abu Dhabi, it's interesting because Saudi is getting these major museums and a couple of little things have cropped up. One is the NYU Abu Dhabi Art Gallery. So we have a main space that is um, a non-collecting museum essentially, and a second space called the Project Space for artists who've never had a solo show before. So we're trying to nourish um, that opportunity. Um, and that's a, that, and many of those artists that we've shown have gone on to have really amazing art careers. Um, so I'm very proud of that. Uh, the other thing that's happened is, um, you know, the Louvre Abu Dhabi has opened and it now gives an, uh, a prize every year to an artist based in the UAE. So there's sort of this top-down 
nourishing that's happening. And, but then on our side, we're also trying to give people space to kind of, what you need is a little bit of messiness. Like in the project space, it's a space where you can um, make some mistakes and try something new. Otherwise, how will you ever do anything interesting if you're not willing to fail, right? And this is, the, this is really crucial. So if you have only top tier polished museums, there's not that in between, whoops, I fell down, I'm gonna get back up and try again, kind of process that education allows you to have. So to that end, we also launched an MFA program, um, which is the first uh, in the UAE, certainly, and I think in the region. Um, so there is, that was only a couple of years old. So there's sort of like, we're still growing. It's still really fast. There's a lot happening um, and, but, with every little moment, it feels like there's an explosion of emerging artists. <laughs> and now there's curators emerging, which is also very exciting. Yeah. Yeah, that's just, it's so interesting how fast it's evolved in that way. Um, yeah. And so you did most definitely answer my other questions of, yeah, like, you know, you being the founding director of the university and the, the, uh, the university museum and the art gallery, and then also this new experimental space, which is that one of the first experiment, like, how many experimental spaces that the community driven or artist driven exist? Um, in, they in kind the of come and go. They come and go. Yeah. 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 I would say there's another place called 421, um, yeah. which has that quality to it as well, which is a super important neighbor. Basically, they're just across on the next island from us. Um, and, but in, du in Abu Dhabi, that's it, as far as I know. And then once you get to Dubai, there's a bunch that sort of, there's like this, another, couple artists have opened up their old family home and turned it into a space for exhibitions. Um, so there's definitely a sense now that this generation, particularly the ones who went through the Salama Foundation Fellowship, came, went back, got their MFAs, came back, and they're starting their own scene. And they're all very clearly sort of descended from this group of five that uh, Muhammad is part of. Yeah, and it, um... I guess it all works hand in hand when you have an MFA program, you've got to have all of this other stuff happening around yeah. it as well. It all just, it is part of that ecosystem. It all feeds into it. Um, so it's really interesting. Um, and just sort of to bring it back to, to uh, the new generation that you speak of, um, you know, Emiratis, and a little bit about me just really quickly. So I was born and raised in Australia, but my parents, were expats in the UAE when I was about 12. So I ended up doing high school in Abu Dhabi in the early 2000s. <laughs> so um, so to, to the point that I'm about to make, I just find it interesting because I've seen personally just that that shift. Um, and I, I've seen that Emiratis and people in the UAE have increasingly um, pursued their education abroad, they're traveling more extensively, they are sort of actively engaging in the global community a whole lot more. Um, and, you know, the UAE itself is such a host to sig a significant expat community um, and this extraordinary diverse population. Um, so I, I would love to hear more about the younger or the, the current generation of Emirati artists. What is, what is this influx of this outside influence? How has that fed into their, their practice? Um, and has there been a balance with um, that and sort of their folk art and their more traditional, um, you know, roots? And is there a legacy that they're sort of carried on of uh, Muhammad Ibrahim's work and, and others in that life or, yeah. So one of the interesting things is the word Emirati because um, somebody can be born and raised there and not be Emirati. Um, and so one of the things that's happened in the most recent generation is a real acknowledgement that the community isn't only passport holding Emiratis, but people who are of the UAE. Um, and that's been a really beautiful shift, I think, um, in particular, uh, because that's always been the case. There's always been artists who are um, working in the UAE who are not necessarily passport holding Emiratis, but they are um, there and part of a really important part of that community. Um, and one of the projects sort of that I've tasked myself with is the reintegration of the people who've been in the UAE into the story. So I ask every artist that I speak to about sort of their development, who else was there in these moments? Who else um, was doing something interesting? And that's when I 
you know, I discover that suddenly it's not actually the five, it's more like the eight or the 12. <laughs> Um, and the, and and this is um, and they wouldn't they wouldn't argue with that at all. They they're very adamant about about this. And I think you see that again as the generations go on. I did a show called Speculative Landscape, which was for artists based in the UAE who were doing incredible sort of landscape based installation. And I think landscape looms really large because of the intensity of the landscape with the desert. Um, so and and the incredibly fast changing built environment, and so these, um, but one is from uh, was from Saudi Arabia, another one was Pakistani, but she'd grown up in Saudi, and then uh, one was uh, Emirati from Dubai, and then the last one was um, Palestinian British, and they so they all had made their homes in Dubai, and they all were doing incredible work, kind of responding to the context of the UAE. Um, and in particular, landscape. Landscape shows up constantly, yeah. Yeah, no, that's so, uh, that's so interesting. And you really, you touch on a really important point there in terms of um, uh, the UAE just being home to so many different, uh, so many different cultures. Um, and it's actually one thing that I appreciate the most about the UAE is just how open and supportive it is um, supportive environment to, to non Emiratis, And I feel like it's specifically with artists, there's a unique trait that the UAE has that's sort of drawn artists from the region um, that otherwise face some obstacles practicing their art um, in, their, in their home countries. So on that, what are the forces that you see that are changing the ecosystem today of the UAE? Well, it's it's sort of the this is going to sound a little cold, but competition is good. Yeah. Yeah. Competition is can be healthy. So, there's, <laughs> so one of the biggest sort of criticisms of the UAE's art scene in the past have been that there was no critical discourse, there was no art criticism, there was no permission to critique, and it, this is partly cultural because um, definitely I have learned since being in the UAE that if I don't have something nice to say, I should be quiet. And um, this is very different from art school, you know, survival. <laughs> and so, so, but with the emergence of these younger generations of artists, the field is getting much more and more dense. And so the competition for, for space and funding and so on um, is, is just at that sort of sweet spot of healthy enough to make you push a little harder, um, but not so much that you give up. And I think this is a really beautiful moment actually to be emerging as an artist in the UAE, but it's, it's hard because there isn't quite enough infrastructure to keep the career moving forward. Um, and so there's a lot of push people sort of leave and then come back. But I think that that's changing really, really quickly. Um, as it's almost like the art community grows and then the infrastructure catches up and then funds the art community, which then grows again. And that, you know, and so you kind of have this this sense of kind of um, expanding and contracting and expanding even more along the way. Yeah. Yeah, that's so um, that's so interesting. I'll I'll ask one more question before I, I hand it to the to the audience. Um, and just on that note, exactly, in your opinion, what do you think does set the UAE apart in the twenty first century, like today in the art world? What's what's so unique about it? Well, embedded in your question is that there is something unique about it, but of course there actually is, which is that it's pretty amazing that a country is doubling down on art, culture, and education, like really doubling down. And that's, I, that, that was one of the biggest shocks to me when I showed up and suddenly it's like art is something that is powerful and dangerous and, um, and you have to handle it with care. And that's a good thing. We want that, we want that discomfort. Um, and that, that, it, that actually I think is gonna grow art itself um, and therefore human experience in a way that I haven't really been able to imagine until I started working in the UAE. Um, thank you, Maya. Uh <laughs>